and see a wisp of smoke among the trees, or a huddle of buildings far, above, far out among the impassable reeds. And twice they came to quite respectable towns, which had several inns to boast of. But on the whole, it was in England, without civilization. The better roads were cleared of cover for a bow shot on either side of them, lest the travelers should be slain by hidden thieves. They slept where they could, sometimes in the hut of some cottager who was prepared to welcome them, sometimes in the castle of a brother knight who invited them to refresh themselves, sometimes in the firelight and fleas of a dirty little hovel with a bush tied to a pole outside it. This was the signboard used at that time by inns, and once or twice on the open ground all huddled together for warmth between their grazing chargers. Wherever they went and wherever they slept, the east wind whistled in the reeds, and the geese went over, over high in the starlight, honking of the stars. Pause for a moment, write it down. Obviously, we've got a passage of setting. And we're being told about how in old England, this is obviously kind of pre-King Arthur becoming actual king, it's not very civilized. One of the subtle things that's being suggested here is that King Arthur's rise, and of course the creation of Camelot, will bring civilization to England. Now to London. London was full to the brim. If Sir Ector had not been lucky enough to own a little land in Pie Street on which there stood a respectable inn, they would have been hard put to it to find lodging. But he did own it, and as a matter of fact, drew most of his dividends from that source, so they were able to get three beds between the five of them. They thought themselves fortunate. On the first day of the turn, Sir Kay managed to get them on the way, to the lists at least, an hour before the joust could possibly begin. He had lain awake all night, imagining how he was going to beat the best barons in England, and he had not been able to eat his breakfast. Now he rode at the front of the cavalcade with his pale cheeks and war wished there was something he could do to calm him down. So now we're getting ready for the actual contest. Kay, of course, hoping that he has the chance to be able to draw the sword from the stone. Notice the irony here, just for your notes. And, and this is typical of legend often. Notice nothing hardly mentioned about our real hero, Arthur, here called a war, um, a, a warrior in training, basically, a squire, right, seem to be. Um, notice nothing mentioned about Arthur at all, other than a brief line that tells us Arthur wishes that he can help Kay out in some way to kind of calm him down. I'm at the top of 1165. For country people, who only know the dismantled, tilting ground of Sir Ector's castle, the scene which met their eyes was ravishing. It was a huge green pit in the earth, about as big as the arena of a football match. It lay ten feet lower than the surrounding country with sloping banks, and the snow had been swept off it. It had been kept warm with straw, which had been cleared off that morning, and now the close-worn grass sparkled green in the, in the white landscape. If you've ever seen a ball field newly cut, that's obviously what we're referencing here. Round the arena there was a world of color so dazzling and moving and twinkling as to make one's blink, one blink one's eyes. The wooden grandstands were painted in scarlet and white. The silk pavilions of famous people pitched on every side with azure and green and saffron checkered. Obviously, it's hard not to read this passage and see in your mind's eye the films that you've probably seen, the videos that you've seen that somehow try to capture this. In your senior year, we'll even reference a really, a, a really old movie now called Excalibur, which plays a very similar game of trying to describe the beauty of the pageantry and all of that. The pinions floated everywhere in the sharp wind, were flapping with their color of the rainbow as they strained and slapped at their flagpoles, and the barrier down the middle of the arena itself was done in chessboard squares of black and white. Most of the combatants and their friends had not yet arrived, but one could see, from those few who had come, how the very people would turn the scene into a bank of flowers, and how the armor would flash, and the scalloped sleeves of the heralds jig in the wind as they raised their brazen trumpets to their lips to shake the fleecy clouds of winter with joyances and fanfares. Good heavens, cried Sir Kay, I've left my sword at home. Can't joust without a sword, said Sir um, Grimo. Um, quite irregular. Better go and fetch it, said Sir Ector. You have time. My squire will do it, said Sir Kay. What an awful mistake to make. Here, squire, ride hard back to the inn and fetch my sword. You shall have a shilling if you fetch it in time. So Arthur is told, as a young boy, go back, fetch the sword. The wart went as pale as Sir Kay was, and looked as if he were going to strike him. Then he said, It shall be done, master, and turned his ambling palfrey against the stream of newcomers. He began to push his way toward their holstery as best he might. To offer me money, cried the wart to himself, to look down 
at this beastly little donkey affair off his great charger and call me squire. Oh, Merlin, give me patience with the brute and stop me from throwing his filthy shilling in his face. You get a sense of the tension that exists between Arthur and his brother King. When he got to the inn, it was closed. Everybody had thronged to see the famous tournament, and the entire household had followed after the mob. Those were lawless days, and it was not safe to leave your house or even to go to sleep in it unless you were certain that it was impregnable. Um, I'm on page 1166. Notice again this referencing to the old days when things were much less law-abiding than obviously it now is. The wooden shutters bolted over the downstairs windows were two inches thick, and the doors were double barred. Now what do I do? asked the ward to earn my shilling. He looked ruefully at the blind little inn and began to laugh. Poor Kay, he said. All that shilling stuff was only because he was scared and miserable, and now he has good cause to be. Well, he shall have a sword of some sort if I have to break into the Tower of London. How does one get hold of a sword, he continued. Where can I steal one? Could I waylay some knight, even if I am mounted on an ambling pad and take his weapons by force? There must be some swordsmith or armorer in a great town like this whose shop would still be open. He turned his mouth and cantered off along the street. There was a quiet churchyard at the end of it. With a kind of square in front of the church door in the middle of the square, there was a heavy stone with an anvil on it, and a fine new sword was stuck through the anvil. Now, of course, as we have said many, many times in our study, both at the freshman year and now in our sophomore year, Great stories challenge you to predict. So obviously you can make your prediction here, of course, knowing either film versions or other versions of this story, you know what's about to happen. This will be a pivotal moment in the history of storytelling, obviously in the history of, of England politics as well. Well, said the war, I suppose it is some sort of war memorial, but it'll have to do. Note the irony. Arthur does not know what it is that he's drawing from the sword, from the anvil, the sword and the stone, right? Uh, I am sure nobody would grudge Kay a war memorial if they knew his desperate straits. He tied his reins around a post of the lich gate, strode up the gravel path, and took hold of the sword. Come, sword, he said. I must cry your mercy and take you for a better cause. This is extraordinary, said the word. I feel strange when I have hold of the sword, and I notice everything much more clearly. Look at the beautiful gargoyles of the church and of the monastery which it belongs to. See how splendidly all the famous banners in the aisle are waving. How nobly that yew holds up the red leaf flakes of its timber to worship God. How clean the snow is. I can smell something like feather-few and sweet briar. And is it music that I hear? Of course, we've got a pivotal moment, right, in legend when something really important happens. You've got all this amazing stuff that starts to happen. It was music whether of pan pipes or of recorders, and the light in the churchyard was so clear without being dazzled that one could have picked a pin out 20 yards away. There is something in this place, said Warren. There are people, oh, people, what do you want? Nobody answered him, but the music was loud and the light beautiful. 1167, people, cried the Lord. I must take this sword. It is not for me, but for Kay. I will bring it back. There was still no answer and Warren turned back to the anvil. He saw the golden letters, which he did not read, and the jewels on the pommel flashing in the lovely light. Come, sword, said the worm. He took hold of the handles with both hands and strained against the stone. There was a melodious consort on the recorders, but nothing moved. The wart let go of the handles when they were beginning to bite into the palms of his hands and stepped back, seeing stars. It is well fixed, he said. So notice, the first time he tries, he can't pull it in this version of the story. He took hold of it again and pulled with all his might. The music played more strangely, and the light all about the churchyard glowed. But the sword still stuck. Oh, Merlin, cried the warp, help me to get this weapon. There was a kind of rushing noise, and a long chord played along with it. All around the churchyard there were hundreds of old friends. They rose over the church wall altogether. Like the Punch and Judy ghosts of remembered days, there were badgers and nightingales and vulgar crows and hares and wild geese and falcons and fish and dogs and dainty unicorns and solitary wasps and hedgehogs and griffins and the thousand other animals he had met. In other words, all of the animal world is ready for this pivotal moment when Arthur's going to draw this sword from the anvil and the stone. They loomed round the church wall, the lovers and helpers of the war, and they all spoke solemnly in turn. Some of them had come from the banners in the church. I'm on page 1168. 
where they were painted and heralded, some from the waters and the sky and the fields about, but all down to the smallest shrew mouse had come to help on account of love. Mort felt his power grow. So notice you got all of the animals in support um, of, of, uh, of the hero, the young boy. Of course, this will take us back to Ashpuddle, our story that we study, the Grimm brothers, the brothers Grimm story, where uh, the, the doves, right, the animals were helping the, the heroine there. Here we've got all the animals helping young Arthur. Put your back into it, said a loose pike off one of the um, heraldic uh, banners, as you once did when I was going to snap you up. Remember that power springs from the nape of the neck. What about these, those forearms, said a badger gravely, that are held together by a chest? Come along, my dear embryo, and find your tool. A merlin, sitting at the top of the yew tree, cried out, Now then, Captain Wart, what is the first law of the foot? I thought I once heard something about never letting go. Don't work like a stalling woodpecker, urged a tawny owl affectionately. Keep up a steady effort, my duck, and you will have it yet. The white front said, Now, Wart, if you were once able to fly the great North Sea, surely you can coordinate a few little wing muscles here and there. Fold your powers together with the lift of your mind, and it will come out like butter. Come along, homo sapiens, for all we humble friends of yours are waiting here to cheer. The Wart walked up to the great stone for the third time. He put out his right hand softly and drew it out as gently as from a scabbard. So in other words, on the third try, again, three is always important in these stories, as we've seen before, he draws the sword from the stone. There was a lot of cheering, a noise like a hurdy-gurdy, which went on and on. In the middle of this noise, about a long time, after a long time, he saw Kay and gave him the sword. The people at the tournament were making a frightful row. But this is not my sword said Sir Kay. It was the only one I could get, said the wart. The end was locked. It's a nice looking sword. Where'd you get it? I found it stuck in a song outside a church. Sir Kay had been watching the tilting nervously, waiting for his turn. He had not paid much attention to his squire. That's a funny place to find one, he said. Yes, it was stuck through an anvil. What? cried Sir Kay suddenly, rounding upon him. Did you just say this sword was stuck in a stone? 1169. It was said the word. It was a sort of war memorial. Sir Kay stared at him for several seconds in amazement. This is obviously what we call irony, right? Opened his mouth, shut it again, licked his lips, then turned his back and plunged through the crowd. He was looking for Sir Ector, and the word followed after him. Father, cried Sir Kay, come here a moment. Yes, my boy, said, her, said Sir Ector. Splendid falls those professional chaps do manage. Why, what's the matter, Kay? You look as white as a sheet. Do you remember that sword which the King of England will pull out? Yes. Well, here it is. I have it. It's in my hand. I pulled it out. Sir Ector did not say anything silly. He looked at Kay, and he looked at the ward. Then he stared at Kay again, long and lovingly, and said, We will go back to the church. Now then, Kay, he said, when they were at the church door, he looked at his firstborn kindly, but straight between the eyes. Here is the stone, and you have the sword. It will make you king of England. You are my son that I am proud of, and always will be, whatever you do. Will you promise me that you took it out by your own mind? So notice Kay is going to take credit for what Arthur has done. Notice father is going to make Kay have to, in fact, tell the truth. Kay looked at his father. He also looked at the ward and at the sword. Then he handed the sword to the wart quite quietly. He said, I am a liar. Wart pulled it out. Let's go ahead and pause, put it in your notes. So Kay, in the end, will show honor. And this is a big part of our story, obviously. Will show honor. He'll tell the truth and he'll say, you know, I can't take credit for something I did not do. Arthur is the one that pulled it out. As far as the wart was concerned, there was a time after this in which Sir Hector kept telling him to put the sword back into the stone, which he did, and in which Sir Hector and Kay then vainly tried to take it out. This is huge for the story, right? This is not about being strong. This is about, for Arthur, being who he is, the son of a great king, um, not Sir Hector, obviously. Right? The war took it out for them, stuck it back in uh, once or twice, and after this, there was another time which was more painful. He saw that his Dear guardian was looking quite old and powerless and that he was kneeling down with difficulty on a gouty knee. Sir, said Sir Ector without looking up at him, although he was speaking to his own boy, 
Please do not do this, father, said the wart, kneeling down also. Let me help you up, Sir Ector, because you are making me unhappy. Well, obviously, Sir Ector recognizes that Arthur is the future king of England. Nay, nay, my lord, said Sir Ector, with some very feeble old tears. I was never your father, nor of my blood, but I will, will ye... Um, are of a higher, well, meaning I, I promise, you're of a higher blood than I when you were. Now, this is huge because it's at this moment that everything comes full circle in our story for Arthur. He has never been told who his real father is, um, Uther the Dragon. He's never been told this. And so his, who he thinks is his father, Sir Ector, is now going to tell him, uh, you, you're not my son. I'm on page 1170. Plenty of people have told me you are not my father, said the word, but it does not matter a bit. Sir, said her actor humbly, will you be my good and gracious lord when you are king? Don't, said the word. Sir, said Sir Ector, I will ask no more of you but that you will make my son, your foster brother, Sir Kay, central of all your lands. Kay was kneeling down too, and it was more than the word could bear. Oh, dude, stop, he cried. He, uh, it, it's, it's ironic, right? Because he thinks they're kind of maybe teasing him. Of course he can be central if I have got to be this king. And oh, father, don't kneel down like that because it breaks my heart. Please get up, Sir Ector, and don't make everything so horrible. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I wish I'd never seen that filthy sword at all. And the word also burst into tears. Well, that's the end of our cutting and the beginning of the story. I'm hoping that you'll be motivated to want to find the rest of the four volumes and read them. It's quite a, quite a wonderful story that White is, is able to build. Of course, at the very end now, notice Arthur doesn't really understand at all the significance of what he's done. And he doesn't even want to be king. Significant, right? The greatest leaders are often those who have leadership kind of forced upon them. It isn't that they're avaricious or greedy for power. It's just simply they are the right person in the right place and in the right time. Let's jump to 2A really quickly. Well, what, it, what makes Arthur a legendary hero early on? Three things. One, notice that he is a person of tremendous confidence, courage, in terms of believing that he can make a change that he can do something right, something good, to help Kay out. I, I don't have his sword, I'll get another sword for him, it's no big deal. Number two, he is respectful of authority, and especially, of course, of who he believes his father is. That is to say, he's humble, we might say. Finally, number three, he is, in the end, not one who desires power, but one who is willing to accept that he's been put in a role where he will, in fact, be a leader. At 2B, of course, legendary hero. Um, here we're talking obviously about one of the greatest of all time. Also at 2B, notice that we have interesting symbolism. Let's write this down. A powerful symbol in the sword. The sword will not just represent being able to rule. The sword will come to represent, the sword Excalibur, will come to represent all things Arthurian, right? And we'll have more to say about this in our study in our senior year. By the way, if you want to look at this earlier before you get to your senior year, you can take a look at this when, you are, uh, when you're on LearnStrong.net. You can go to the, the Senior A folder, and there's lectures there about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and all of that. Of course, in 3A, well, you can obviously write down for you the texts that are somewhat similar. Are you familiar with film versions or video games that play off of this motif of the sword in the stone? What is for you your favorite text where the hero of the text starts out a complete and total nobody and doesn't want to be a leader and yet is kind of almost like forced into being a leader? Do you have a, do you have a text that comes to mind in that regard? Finally, at 3B, have you ever been in a moment like this where you were asked to do something, asked to stand up, and you really didn't want it at all? I remember a student of mine saying in his sophomore year, he was a good ball player, that he, and he ended up, on, a, and he ended up um, on the JV squad as a sophomore being voted the team captain. And he didn't want it. He figured that his best friend would be the one that would be voted team captain. And when the team voted him the captain, he, he, he said, guys, I, I'm, not, I'm not a leader. I, it's, and they all said, no, no, we want you to lead us. And of course, he, remind, he, he said in class, it reminds me of what Arthur's like in, in, this, in this text. Finally, what's a time that you had to be a leader? What's a time that you had to stand up and you had to lead people? And even if you didn't want to do it, you did it. 
And did you do it well or did you do it poorly and why? Well, an introduction, there you go. We'll turn now to the Tennyson offering to continue the Arthurian motif. Thank you.